This is part four of our series on the Comforter. Matthew chapter one, verse 18. I want to show you how that uh, the Comforter not only came from the Father and came through Jesus Christ to us, but I want to show you how this come about through Jesus Christ to begin with. All right, Matthew chapter one, verse 18. Listen up close because some of this is probably going to sound a little bit different than what your doctrine uh, normally you might be used to. But no matter what we believe, we need to line up with what the scriptures teach and not what we believe. We need to hold on to the scriptures and what God says instead. All right. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of, who do you suppose the child's father is? It says, with child of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the father of Jesus Christ because here it says, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Word of God says. Okay, so the Holy Ghost has to be the Father. So how can we separate the Father from the Holy Ghost if he is the Father of Jesus Christ? Okay, verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Again, you see the picture here that the Father of Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. And there's a reason for that because the Holy Ghost is God. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So there again, it shows that the Father, which is God, is also the Holy Ghost. They're one and the same. There cannot be any separation. The Father is the Holy Ghost. Okay, we're going to see this again as we go into these other scriptures. All I'm doing is presenting the scriptures here. And it's very, very clear that God and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Uh, a lot of people, when you get into these kinds of uh, scriptures, a lot of people get offended. And so I ask people to just please bear with me. Because these things are going to, you know, there are things that contradict the doctrine that we have grown up with that are within the scriptures. But eventually we want to come to the understanding of all the scriptures, not just a few of them. And we want to look at these scriptures really, really close. Okay. We don't want to get offended because of things that we've been taught. We want to believe what the scriptures say and nothing else. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. It says, child of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost has to be the father of Jesus Christ. They are one and the same. There's no separation between the Holy Ghost and the Father. They are one. All right. Verse 19 
of Matthew 1. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. There again, you see that Jesus is a child of the Holy Ghost, just as it said in verse 18, with child of the Holy Ghost. Here again, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now we've got to remember that the breath of God that carries the word to us is the Holy Ghost. Okay, I looked up that scripture, or uh, I looked up that word spirit and ghost within the the uh, Greek text, and it is the breath of God. So the breath of God planted the word in her, and you can't separate his breath from himself because the breath comes out from within him. It was part of him before it came out, and so it was part of God. So being a child of God and being a child of the Holy Ghost is one and the same. There's no way to divide it. Okay. It says, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, remember, God is a spirit. All right. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of God. Okay. Now we're going to go to verse 21. It says, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay, there it is again. God with us. The Spirit of God is God. Okay, now we're going to go to Mark chapter 1. Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now watch what it says here. The Son of God. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But yet we've already seen it says child of the Holy Ghost. Okay, but he is the son of God. So you can't separate the Holy Ghost from the Father. All right, they're one. The Father is the Holy Ghost. No way around that one. All right, this is Mark 1 verse 6. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. And preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. It says in verse 8, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. When Jesus came back after he was being raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead on the third day, went to heaven. He received all power in heaven and earth. He received the promise of the Holy Ghost, which is where all the power comes from is through the Holy Ghost, through God. Okay, when he came back, he breathed on the apostles, and that was in John chapter 20, verse 21 of John 20 says, then said Jesus to them. Now remember, this is after he was raised from the dead. After he received all power, not just some, but all power in heaven and earth was placed upon him. He went back into the bosom of the Father where he came out from in the beginning as the word, the spoken word of God. He went back into the bosom of the Father. The Father surrounded him at that point and became one with him again. Now, uh, John chapter 20 verse 21 says then said Jesus to them he came back down to earth and then he spoke 
to the ten disciples at this time. It says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay? Jesus gave them the Holy Ghost. This was before Pentecost. This was like 49 days before Pentecost. This was the breath of life coming back to man once again. That same breath of life that, that God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul. That same breath of life came through Jesus Christ and empowered the apostles at that time. And it was just 10 of them. Thomas was not there with them at that moment. Okay, but when Jesus Christ came back, he came back as all of God. There was no more division there. He came back as the Father completely engulfed him. Okay, and so all power was given him. So that means everything that the Father was, was put upon him. He got his full inheritance. And then he came back and started distributing that inheritance to others. And that was when he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That was John 20, verses 21 and 22. That is the type and the shadow for receiving the breath of life in the Garden of Eden. And then later, God told Adam what it would take for him to keep that breath of life. That also matches what happened on the mount with Moses when he got the commandments and they were given. The fire came down on the mount. That matches what happened on Pentecost. The law was given. That matches what happened on Pentecost. And all of that also matches the barley harvest. The barley harvest is a duplicate for what happened on the mount with Moses and what happened on Pentecost. There's the first sheaves wave offering, and I got into a lot of that yesterday. And what happened on Pentecost was God spoke through the tongues of fire. That would be the commandment that was given to them in order to keep what they had. They had the power to become the sons of God was given to them then. And so that all fits the picture. You have the first sheaves wave offering of the of the barley. And then they were to count seven weeks of seven days, which would have been the 49 days. And then Pentecost happened. Okay, so it all matches up throughout the scripture. It's awesome. So anyways, Jesus is the one that gave the Holy Ghost. All right, and then we see that in Mark 1 verse 8. It's telling this picture. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Okay, first he gave them the breath of life, then the baptism came later. It might all be part of the same baptism. It's like the Holy Ghost came down on them many, many times, and they were empowered with different things each time the Holy Ghost came down them. It's like with us, we have to grow up into him in all things, and we need that refreshing and renewing of the Holy Ghost at all times so that we can walk in that spirit all the time. All right, now it says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. When he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, I don't know if that would be considered part of that baptism or if that was uh, he actually shed forth what they saw and heard on Pentecost. And we'll get into some of that here in a little while, I think. That was after he had gone back to heaven and then he shed forth part of his body to them. That is our inheritance. We become part of the body through Jesus Christ, through his body, which is his word. And so as we consume the word through his spirit, we also become part of his body. We become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh through the spirit of God. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 1. It's going to be our next one. All right, Luke 1 verse 30 says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, 
thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Okay, here's that picture again. And what I like to do is pull this picture out of each of the different scriptures that talks about it. So you can get a little bit more because each one of the gospels has a little bit more of the picture than others have. It's like you put all those books together and then you see the whole. And, and the Lord did this all the way through the Bible. You put uh, the books of the uh, prophets together and you start seeing in each one of them, it's like he has the same picture repeated over and over and over again through the scriptures. And when you start putting them together, you get little pieces of the picture from one scripture and then it might be clear at the other end of the Bible, you might see another piece of the picture. And that's why it's so important for us to study to show ourselves approved. It's like this humongous jigsaw puzzle. And there's pieces all over. And when you really, really start digging and you do these word searches is how the Lord showed me how to do this. You look up the word that you want to find out what it means. Like, for example, Holy Ghost. That's what we're doing today is Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and Comforter. I looked up all of those in order to put this teaching together. And this is how it has come about. And then whatever else the Lord hit me with while I was doing this, I put into the scriptures with this teaching. But when you do that, say, for example, you want to look up the word dragon all the way through the scriptures. Through that one study, I found out that uh, the dragon is also uh, the serpent, Satan. He's uh, the crooked serpent. He is uh, the head over the house of the wicked. He has his own rivers instead of the river of life. Just through that one study, found all these things. I also found out that the Pharaoh is also the great dragon. The Pharaoh that was keeping the Israelites captive. It all fits into that picture, and it's awesome. And he was in the Garden of Eden. And I've got that teaching in here in uh, the archives somewhere as well. But when you do these word searches, you start seeing the interpretation that God has for the things instead of our own interpretation. You look at, if you want to know about the Holy Ghost, you look up every place where the Holy Ghost is. That's how you find out the understanding. And that's how we do these things here. And that's what I did. Okay, Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. So, so far we have the Son of God, the Son of the Highest, and a child of the Holy Ghost. So that shows that that God and the, and the Highest and the Holy Ghost are all one and the same. There's no separation. Praise God. All right. It says here in verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign, this is verse 33 of Luke 1, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Okay, we already saw that the Holy Ghost is the power of the highest. Okay, it says, the, uh, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So right there it shows that the Father is the Holy Ghost because they're saying the Holy Ghost does it, but he's going to be called the Son of God. Okay, there it is again. Isn't that awesome? All right, next one is going to be 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. 
Now watch what this says. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ had the Father as part of him. And at, when he spoke and healings and things was, was done, the manifestation of God was present to heal people. It says God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Notice here, this is talking about God was received up into glory. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Okay, now we're going to go to John 1.1. 1, 1. See, if we don't look at every single word within these scriptures, we miss so much. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. Remember, I told you, Jesus Christ was part of the Father in the beginning. Okay? God spoke. Jesus is the word. What people keep forgetting is Jesus is God's word that God spoke. He was part of the Father to begin with. God spoke his words and what came out of God was Jesus Christ. Carried by the Holy Ghost. Carried by the wind of God. The seed is the word. And it is carried by the Spirit of God. Just like the wind carries the seed outside to the ground. Well, the Spirit of God is a duplicate for the wind. It's the spiritual side of things instead of the physical side. And God's wind carries His seed, which is His Word, which is Jesus. And plants Him in our hearts. Okay. So it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He was in, in God. He was part of God. It says, and the Word was God. If you speak words, when you speak words, they are coming out of you. They were part of you when you spoke. And if you put your hand, like I was telling people yesterday, if you put your hand in front of your mouth as you speak, you feel the wind come out from you. Okay, it was part of you before it came out. There's moisture that comes out. Part of your body is coming out with those words. Okay, so it was part of God when he spoke. The word was his word. It was part of him, has his name on it, the whole shooting match. Okay, so it says, let's see, and the word was with God and the word was God. You can't separate the word or the Holy Ghost from the Father, because God is a spirit, and it, every bit of it came from within him. Okay, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, that's the word, because without the word being spoken, nothing was made. God said, let there be light, and the word, Jesus Christ, is the light that came out of him. God sent him forth as he spoke him. That's also within the scriptures it talks about. And see, this is why it's so important to understand this picture. Because we try to put labels on things. We try to separate all the different parts of God. You know, it's like the seven spirits of God. We try to, we try to almost make each one of these as a different God. What we do... We keep ourselves from the understanding of the scriptures when we do that because we kind of blindside ourselves with we get this picture, we get this image in our mind of what God should fit. And when it doesn't fit, we get offended. As soon as we read a scripture that doesn't match what we believe, an offense comes a lot of times. And so we don't want to accept all of the picture that God's given us. We want to accept what our minds have been used to instead. And we don't want to do that. And that's why people get offended when you start talking about doctrine because they've locked themselves into this doctrine, their picture of what they think God is, and it's not the picture that's within the scriptures. Otherwise, if it was, we wouldn't have so many different doctrines out there. There would only be one. 
And so we want to dig deep and find only the doctrine of God. And it is here. If we're willing to put aside our own ways, our own image of him, and just look at the image that the word of God presents, it's completely different than what we may think he is. All right, it says, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, that's by the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. So nothing was made without the word. Okay, it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. There's the word again. It is our life, and it is the light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What the word does is exposes all of the things that can harm us that's out in the world. And that's what a light does. If you're walking around in the darkness and you have a flashlight, if you shine that flashlight before you, it's like the Spirit of God goes before us and prepares the way. Well, his word, when you speak the word, his word goes out of you and prepares the way. Okay? All right. Well, the flashlight does the same thing. You shine that flashlight in front of you so you don't stumble on stuff. So you don't fall in a pit. And the Bible talks about the pits that the devil has dug for us. The uh, snares that he has laid for us. The stumbling stones that can trip us and make us fall. Those are all enticements of the devil to try to get us to sin. But God gives us that picture so that we can understand it. And he calls it stumbling stones. Because we know if we trip and fall on a stone, we're going to get hurt. And so the lies of the enemy is like a stumbling stone. The snares that he has set for us is the sins he tries to catch us in. We get our foot caught in that snare. And he binds us with the cords of our sin, which would be the cord of that snare. Okay, it's the same picture, but God is giving us, he's trying to give us a spiritual understanding through pictures that we can understand from our flesh to a degree so that we can get a picture of him. It's spiritual picture, but he gives us a flesh picture so that we can relate to, so we can understand. So he's the light that shows us, his word is the light, and it shows us all the things that the enemy uses to try to seduce us and trip us up. All the things that he can end up catching us with if we remain in our flesh and don't allow the Spirit of God to guide us instead. Okay, so it says, in him was life. Now remember, the breath that carries the word is the same breath that God breathed into Adam's nostrils. So there's the life and the word itself also is life. John 6 verse 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, now this was Jesus speaking, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the word also is spirit. It's the Holy Ghost. It is God because it came from God originally. Okay, so the word is God and the spirit is God. It all came out from God to begin with. Praise God. Okay, the word is life. The spirit is life. And the words that, that he speaks is spirit and they are spirit and they are life. It says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They're God. They're part of God. Okay. All right. So it says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. Darkness would be areas of sin. The light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. If we are in sin... Our flesh can't understand the spiritual things of God through our flesh. We have to have the Spirit of God to open up our understanding of the spiritual things. When Jesus came here, he came as a light in the midst of that dark world. But 
they didn't want to receive him. And it shows here, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. They didn't understand him. They didn't understand that he was actually God in the flesh. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh. Okay, that's what happened in the womb of Mary. The word itself was made flesh and dwelt among us. The seed of the word of God was planted in her womb and it conceived. Okay, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the Bible talks about many sons of God, but Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. We become sons of God through the Son of God growing up in us. It actually changes our flesh being into a spiritual being. We are recreated in his image and that all takes place through the word, the seed that gets planted in our hearts and that seed sprouts and gets watered by more of the word. It's the same picture as when you plant a seed in your garden. It starts out in the earth. We were formed of the dust of the earth. So where's, where's God going to plant a seed? But in the dust of the earth. Where do you plant your seed in the garden? It's going to be in the dust of the earth. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Well, that seed needs water. There's the spirit of God. There's more of the word of God. The waters of the word that washes us clean. Okay. The uh, seed starts growing in us. And it's that tree of life springing up within us. Eventually, as that tree of life grows within us, inside of us, it consumes our flesh. Just like a tree consumes whatever is around it, the word of God will consume our flesh completely as we grow up into him in all things. We start out with him convicting us of a few things. As we grow more and more like him, we get convicted of more and more things that don't agree with him. We put them away and then the spirit of God grows in us even more and consumes more of our flesh and more of our flesh until eventually there will be no flesh left. And that's when the scriptures talk about mortality gets swallowed up of immortality. It's literally swallowed up. That just like when a tree grows, it swallows up its environments and spreads its roots out. Well, that's what happens in us as that plant grows. It eventually swallows us up completely as it's watered by more of the water of the word. Praise God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. All right. If you plant a seed, it's going to grow the same kind of tree that it was planted from. Well, Jesus is the tree of life. So if his word seed is planted in us, a tree of life is going to grow up in us. And we become part of him. And in fact, he even talks about us being his branches. He is the main root and offspring of David. And we are grafted into that tree through the word of God being grafted into our hearts. The nourishment from the tree to the branch is the word of God, the waters of the word. That is the nourishment. If we don't continue getting the nourishment from the tree, eventually that branch will die. If we don't abide in him and let him abide in us at all times, the nourishment is going to cause the branch to wither up. And when he starts seeing that branch or the leaves wither, he's going to cut that branch off because it's not willing to accept the nourishment from the tree. And so he's going to save the nourishment for those that are willing. It's like uh, there are scriptures in the uh, parables that talk about him taken away from those that have and given it to them that hath not. He will take take the word from us that we do have and he'll give it to others. He'll cut our branch off and cast us into the fire. And that's that eternal fire. Okay, I was going to tell you, we become sons of God through the Son of God growing in us. We end up because Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, he grows up in us through his seed. 
And so we become sons of God because we are part of him. Isn't that awesome? That's how it happens. You know, there's a a saying out there, you are what you eat. Well, in this case, when we consume the lamb of God, we are what we eat and what we obey. Praise God. All right. Verse, uh, let's see, verse 14 of John 1. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Notice the words, full of grace and truth. We did a study on grace uh, quite a while back. We did one of those word searches. The grace of God is Jesus Christ. It is the Spirit of God. That is the Comforter. It is uh, the grace of God. He is the grace of God. The life of God is the grace of God. And Jesus was full of the life of God. It says full of grace and truth. And that's grace is also his truth. Okay. Verse 33 says, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom... Thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. There again, it's showing that Jesus Christ is the one that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Without Jesus Christ as that mediator, he's the door. We can't get to God any other way. We have to go through the door, the one and only door. The sacrifice Jesus made for us in order to make a way to the Father. He is the sacrifice offering we must go through in order to get to God. He's the one mediator. Okay, it says, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. I need to look up the one about the dove. Because notice it's talking about He saw the Spirit descending. Now, God can make His Spirit manifest in front of our physical eyes. Normally, it is invisible. But He can cause a manifestation to come forth so that we can actually see the Spirit. Okay, and He did this in this case. And it was as a dove. Okay, Mark 1 verse 8 says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove. It doesn't say it was a dove, the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice. Now, you didn't just have the spirit, but you also had a voice. And people try to separate this. It's like, well, how can you have the spirit here and the father speaking there? Well, it's because the spirit was sent out. Suppose, for example, like Jesus blew on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay, God could blow on Jesus Christ and then speak more words afterwards. You know, it's it's not like it's not, not the same thing. It all came from the Father to begin with. He spoke the words, but he also sent the Holy Ghost, which is his breath as well. Because if you look up Holy Ghost, you're going to see it is the breath of God. <laughs> Praise God. All right, so it says here, And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. God wanted him to be able to see the spirit. And so he manifested it enough so that he would be able to see it. Okay. And it it was in the shape like a dove, which is very interesting because doves was something also used as a sacrifice. And in fact, one day uh, the Lord was... He gave me a vision. I was praying one day and and I saw in this vision. It was so beautiful. You see these things in the movies, how they form one item into another. How how, uh, it's almost metamorphosis from one item to another. And in this vision, the Lord did that. It was awesome. 
what he showed me first was the hind end of a lamb. You know, like a, a sacrificial lamb. All I saw was the, the back side of the lamb. And, and it was kneeling on its knees. And then I saw, and I'm trying to remember exactly how I saw this. It went from the lamb to a cross. And then the cross uh, changed into a sword. The cross changed into the sword. Then the sword turned into fire. Okay, the cross went changed into a sword right before my eyes. I saw this metamorphosis like thing take place. It literally changed in front of my eyes. The cross changed into the sword. The sword started on fire. It became fire, but it still had the shape of the sword. And as it became fire, it changed into the shape of a dove and it flew off. It was absolutely awesome because the sword of the Lord is the word of God and without the cross and the sacrifice we wouldn't have any of it isn't that awesome and he just he showed me all of that it went from the lamb to the cross to the sword the flaming sword and that flaming sword by the way is what stands between us and the tree of life the flaming sword in the Garden of Eden. Remember, there was this flaming sword put there. And in fact, let me pull that up. It's cool. I did it. I did a study on the flaming sword, too. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. It says, So he drove out the man. This is after they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. It says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You got to go through the sword, which is the door, which is the word, which is Jesus, which is the cross. <laughs> we have to go through the word of God in order to get to God. The word of God is our mediator. And it has to be planted in us and grow up in us. Isn't that awesome? And so anyways, that's the picture the Lord was giving me. And that flaming sword stands between us and the uh, tree of life, which also is the book of life, by the way. The word of God is also the book of life. And that all prepares our way to get to the Father. Isn't that awesome? Jesus Christ is right there in between. He's that door. He's that mediator. And without the word, we don't have any hope at all. That is what gets us to the Father. All right. Let's see. Where was I? Okay. We did the dove. Okay. Now let's go to John chapter 3, verse 34. I never know when I get into these studies where the Lord's going to take me. I just kind of sit back and, and uh, go along for the ride. <laughs> Because if he puts something on my heart, that's what I want, where I want to go. Okay, this is John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. Just like when God sends us, our job is to do but one thing, and that is obey whatever he gives us to do or speak whatever he gives us. Jesus spoke whatever God gave him to speak. Or he did whatever the Lord showed him to do. We're just an extension of the Father. That's what all of us are that work for God. We are just an extension of the Father. He's the master. He calls us his servants. And we are just to do whatever he wants us to do. Okay, so it says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. Same spirit was within Jesus. That came out from God when he spoke. Same thing. It says, For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. He had the fullness. See, we have to grow up yet. We start out with the milk of the word. And we grow up into him in all things. In fact, let me see if I can find that scripture. That is Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. I love doing this. You have no idea. And when I do this, it's when we let the river of life flow through us, we get more. 
automatically. Well, if you think about it, when a river flows through something, uh, through through an area of land, well, some of that water is going to soak into the land. And so when we're just doing what God wants us to do, we get more of God as we're doing it. It's just awesome. Just like that river soaks into the land. Well, it some of that is going to soak into us as well as we're speaking the word to others. It's just awesome how God works that way. I love it. And it all fits that picture, that physical picture. Praise God. So that we can understand. Okay, Ephesians 4 verse 15. It says, but speaking the truth in love, that's in Jesus. He is the love of God, by the way. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. We grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He's the head, we're the body. Each one of us is parts of the body, and that's why we each have different functions. It's awesome. Okay, another one I want to throw out here while we're talking about that is when Paul talked about travailing in birth. And that is Galatians 4, and it's in verse 19. Okay, and he said, this is Galatians 4, verse 19. He said, my little children of whom... I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Isn't that awesome? He is actually formed within us. And it all starts with the seed of the word. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Praise God. He is formed in us and we he grows up. We grow up into him in all things. That's getting rid of everything that doesn't agree with him until mortality has been swallowed up of immortality completely. Praise God. Okay. We start out with the milk of the word. Okay. The Bible even talks about that. The milk of the word. And then it talks about the meat. Later on, well, you guys are getting some meat today. <laughs> We're having steak, praise God. All right, let's see. Where in the world was I on this teaching? Okay, let's see. Oh, spirit by measure. All right. Well, we each have a measure of the gift of Christ. And in fact, let me show you that. Okay, that will be in Ephesians 4, verse 7. Where we're getting a lot of stuff in Ephesians 4. It says... But unto every one of us is given grace. Remember, grace is the Spirit of God. Given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The measure of the gift. How much have we grown up into him? That's the measure of the gift that we have. The amount that we have grown up into him. And we have grace according to that measure. It says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Well, because grace and the gift of Christ, it's all one and the same. He is the gift of God. He is the grace of God. And so it fits. <laughs> it fits the scriptures. Praise God. All right. Let's see. Back to where we were. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I need to pull up something else. That's Ephesians 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. So each part has a, their measure of the body. But we all come together and then there's the fullness of the body of Jesus Christ. But he wants him to grow up in each and every one of us to that fullness, to that fullness, that stature of Jesus Christ. Okay, it says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of, in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body. That one body grows and grows and grows and grows through each one of us. Okay, it says, uh, 
every joint supply according to the effectual working in the measure of every part were parts of his body. It says, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The body needs to continually grow and spread out into others as well. And it's like the branches on the tree. Each one of us, this is something else the Lord showed me one time, and it's absolutely awesome. If you think about the tree as Jesus Christ, and each one of us is a branch on that tree. Well, think about it. Each branch has branches that come off of them also. And so each time we bring somebody into the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ, it's like another branch that, that is hooked to our branch. And then that branch grows and more branches grow off of that one branch. Isn't that awesome? Each time somebody comes into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and becomes part of his body, it's like there's another branch that, that buds and springs forth from the branch before it. But we're all hooked in, okay, to that one main tree. Isn't that awesome? And so each little little bud that comes off of that branch, it's like, well, look at the apostles. That would be like a tree with 12 original branches. Jesus is the trunk. And then each one of the apostles would have been like a branch off of that trunk. Okay. And, and if you look at the uh, books in uh, Revelation, you'll see there's going to be 12 manner of fruits. Well, that's because there was 12 apostles. Isn't that cool? It's awesome. Praise God. All right. So then we grow off of what they have fed us of the word of God because they wrote down the epistles and things for us. And so we're growing, we're springing forth from those branches. And then each one of us ends up with branches too. Isn't that cool? Praise God. But it all comes through the nourishment from the tree because without the word of God flowing through each one of those branches there's no way any more can spring forth from them the word of God is the life it would be the nourishment flowing through all the branches like the sap of the tree praise God let's see Ephesians 4 verse 11 Okay, remember, these are giftings from God. This is particular offices that he sets in, in the earth. Uh, as they have grown up into him, then he divides them into offices. It says, and he gave some apostles, and the apostles were the first ones. Okay, it says, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Here's the purpose of all that. So if they're not doing the purpose of, then what good are they? If they're not edifying the body of Christ like it's talking about here and bringing them into the perfection of the saints, then them in, being in those offices is not doing the purpose that God set them out for to begin with. It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all, now here's growing up into him in all things, till we all, not just some of us, he wants all of us maturing. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Well, who's the perfect man? Jesus Christ. We grow up into him until our flesh has been consumed completely with his immortality. Mortality will be swallowed up of immortality that tree grows so much in us that there's none of us left the tree overtakes us it says for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come in the unity of the faith okay and then it's going to show how that takes place and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man it's through the knowledge of the son of god See, that's what the teachers and the apostles and the prophets are. They are to train the child up in the way they should go. And when they are old, they won't depart from it. Praise God. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. 
That's until we've grown up as Jesus Christ fully. It says, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is when that plant has grown up into him in all things. And we then are that mature tree grown up, that tree of life. And that tree of life is ready to reproduce after its kind. Because then it produces seed and produces fruit that will also grow in the earth. That's the end of part four of our series on the Comforter. Come back again next time for part five.